This is the meeting place of the Atlantic and Indian Oceans. The early Portuguese navigator who discovered these waters named the peninsula separating the two oceans the Cape of Storms. His king, dreaming of the riches of East Indian trade, renamed it the Cape of Good Hope. It is here in the tumultuous waters off the southernmost tip of South Africa that the divers of Calypso have come to observe the ancient pinnipeda, those feather-footed marine mammals, the Cape fur seals. March 7. Yesterday, off the Cape of Good Hope, our divers encountered a yearling seal in the rich kelp beds near Seal Island. Today, we have decided to delay our crossing the Atlantic Ocean for Caribbean waters. Instead, we are setting off to see the Cape fur seals which long ago captivated our hearts. As children, we first saw them in the zoos of Paris and read of Cotic the Seal in Rudyard Kipling's Jungle Stories. Captain Cousteau has asked the divers and cameramen of Calypso to survey Seal Island, a seal rookery isolated deep inside False Bay, lying to the east of the Cape of Good Hope. In a recent 250-year period, hunters of ladies' fashions and lamp oil reduced seal populations from many millions to mere hundreds of thousands. Other than man, the only natural enemy of the seal is the shark or the killer whale. Harem life on the Cape Rookeries is dominated by the fighting beach masters, bulls weighing up to 600 pounds. Each year, they return over thousands of miles of ocean to their birthplace. Here, they become indisputable lords of creation. Females mate with the beach masters immediately after giving birth to a single 10 to 12 pound pup conceived the previous year. The pups are born with eyes open, fully developed coats of fur, and ready to scurry away from the confusion of adult harem life. At irregular intervals, the pups are nursed, taking up to a gallon of their mother's milk at a single feeding. Other than meal times, they are on their own. They teach themselves how to swim, first in the tidal pools, and then in the sea itself. Cousteau has asked his cameraman to use a protective shark cage. This is an extra precaution against possible attacks, 
by suddenly frightened cows returning to suckle their pups after days of feeding at sea. So divers are to observe the reactions of these highly evolved marine carnivores to the first men they have probably ever seen who have joined them peacefully in their adopted environment. Gregarious and playful among their own kind, the seals react to the divers with cautious curiosity. And unlike fish, who are easily coaxed to take food from a friendly diver's hand, the seals, with a brain larger than a dog's but smaller than that of a porpoise, are wary of unprecedented handouts of horse mackerel. Unable to further delay his Atlantic voyage, Cousteau makes an intuitive and spontaneous decision. Two male yearlings will be taken aboard Calypso. Objective, to observe the possible natural development of affection and loyalty between a man and a wild sea mammal. Men on a rookery means only one thing to fur seals, death. Therefore, even with honorable intentions, we are feared. will come to name the first of the Cape Fur Seals to be captured, Pepito. And the second, Cristobal. But now, in this their first terrified moments of captivity, they are simply 65 pounds of nameless fighting muscle and needle-sharp teeth. This is the beginning of the unexpected voyage of Pepito and Cristobal. They have no way of knowing what lies ahead, so they do not go easily or willingly from their ancient and ancestral hauling out place. It has been said that when some of the hunting tribesmen of Africa or Indians of the American plains were placed in inescapable captivity, they would let go of life, sit down and die. The seal too is a nomadic hunter. As the launch came alongside and Pepito and Cristobal were brought on board, we wondered if we were doing the right thing. Was our hypothesis correct that man could be friend and live in harmony with a sea mammal 
in the same way that he does with a dog or a horse. For Pepito and Cristobal, too, it was an anxious moment as they bid silent goodbyes to their young friends frolicking freely in the wild surf of their home and sanctuary, first named the Cape of Storms. two days out of Cape Town, South Africa, en route to Grenadine Island in the Caribbean. Pepito and Cristobal have settled down nicely, but before we can begin our training, we must provide them with more suitable living conditions. Fur seals spend nearly 80% of their lives in the sea. Because they can easily die from overexposure to heat, we must construct a small swimming tank with circulating seawater. The second order of business is to rig up a remote television camera focused on the training area. By this technique, the watch can observe Pepito and Cristobal should the unfamiliar rolling of their new rookery cause them to become entangled in their net enclosures. Always the gentleman, Zoom makes the first formal overture of shipboard hospitality, but Cristobal rejects him out of hand. Zoom wanders morosely off to nurse his imagined grievances about the new peck order of things. Cautious at first, Pepito and Cristobal take to the completed swimming tank as though it were some long lost tidal pool out of their puppy days on Seal Island. Michel Bernard has used his ingenuity to fashion a suit of leather armor to protect himself against the unpredictable behavior of Pepito and Cristobal. Their jaws have the potential ripping and shearing power of a young grizzly bear. The safety of the men is of paramount importance. So the first time Pepito and Cristobal are placed in the training area, it is a rather undignified affair. Probably the first and most natural bond which can be developed between a man and any animal is food. So our training of Pepito and Cristobal begins with fish. Able to be nourished by stored up blubber fat, seals, sea lions, and walruses have the physiological resources to fast up to two weeks at a time when their natural food supply disappears. But when the feeding conditions are good and steady, an adult fur seal can consume an average of 15 to 20 pounds of fish, squid, and crustaceans every day. Almost from the beginning, we could see that Pepito and Cristobal were of two distinctly different temperaments. 
Pepito responded to training and handling with a natural gentleness and affection. Cristobal, on the other hand, probably a little older than Pepito and more set in the ways of the wild, continued to be suspicious of our motives. In spite of his churlishness, we were determined to overwhelm him with love, even though at times Cristobal sorely tried our resolve and Michel Bernard's suit of leather armor. One sport we do not enjoy about Calypso is fishing. Because of Pepito and Cristobal, we have no choice. We simply must take on fresh food. By using lights which attract mostly sardines and anchovies, it does not take long to catch 20 pounds of fish, enough to feed Pepito and Cristobal for a day. Sometimes flying fish, confused by the lights like strange marine moths, miscalculate their glide paths and end up on the deck as unexpected midnight snacks for Pepito and Cristobal. March 26th. We have cleared Ascension Island nearly halfway across the Atlantic. Pepito has integrated into the life and routine of Calypso with astonishing speed. Cristobal remains somewhat reserved, but he is intelligent and tries to accept our eccentric ways. And while equal grooming attention has helped, we are also especially pleased with Zoom, who has decided to put aside his pride and accept the presence of our new friends. As more and more days go by, an indication of Pepito's growing trust and affection for the men of Calypso is in his tolerant response to an ancient practical joke. Squid and octopus, even from frozen stores, are like crepe Suzettes to fur seals. So the doctor's vitamin tablet goes unnoticed in one satisfying gulp. Cousteau has another reason for starting Pepito and Cristobal on a heavy diet of squid. It is easily cut up into boneless, bite-sized pieces, which facilitates hand feeding when placed in specially devised jars to be worn on the belts of the divers, Falco and Cole. <laughs> Exclusively associating the jars of squid with the suited up divers is the next important step in the training of Pepito and Cristobal. For Falco and Cole will be responsible for the critical sea training phase of this remarkable experiment between man and sea mammal. As Calypso nears its Caribbean destination, Falco and Cole spend endless hours familiarizing Pepito and Cristobal with the feel of the dog-like harnesses and leashes improvised as sea training restraints. <coughs> Ultimately, Cousteau hopes that Pepito and Cole and Falco and Cristobal 
will swim together free in the sea, held together only by the bonds of loyalty and affection. Thirty-two days and four hours out of Cape Town, we drop anchor at Tobago Keys, located in the Grenadine Islands of the Caribbean. We knew it would be here, in the clear waters fed by the Gulf Stream, that we would finally learn if we had made the right decision, a kindly decision. We had done all we could to befriend Pepito and Cristobal. It was now up to them. April 12th. Today marks a significant event in the lives of Pepito and Cristobal. For the first time in the 36 days since they last played on the rocky slopes of their native rookery, they will touch land. It is a preliminary step to familiarize them with their new Caribbean holding out place before the commencement of sea training. They have only been in the launch once before as frightened, savage creatures bundled in nets, unaccustomed to the sight and smell of man and his equipment. In a little more than a month, most of their fears are gone. According to plan, Cristobal will go with Falco and Pepito with Col. We are not sure Cristobal is quite ready for this experience, but we shall see. Nearing the shore of the island cove, Cristobal and Pepito sense the drama of the moment. Cole soothes Pepito, but Cristobal's restlessness is not as easily calmed. As the launch crunches into the soft sand of the beach, Cristobal instinctively responds, as apparently he must, to the irresistible drum song of the sea. A huge dip net is the only expedient way to retrieve a determined fur seal. It is undignified, but if Cristobal escapes at this moment, encumbered by leash and harness and thousands of miles from the nearest hauling out place, he would have no chance of survival. So it will be back to the safety of the Calypso rookery for Cristobal. As I watched Cristobal being returned to Calypso, 
I had a hunch down in my sea bones that Cristobal had not tried to leave us, but that he had merely become overexcited with the prospect of a long delayed romp in the sea. Cristobal would get his wish, but for his own safety, we had first to enclose a small cove with the ship's nets. By April 16th, the netted enclosure is prepared. Falco and Cole are about to commence the sea training of Pepito and Cristobal. Pepito is calm. Cristobal, now apparently confident that Falco is aware of his primeval needs, is also calm. As we watched Pepito and Cristobal with our divers, we silently wondered if we were not expecting too much from our wild and innocent friends, the gentle ones with the head of a bear. Up to this moment, men had only crudely exploited these creatures as circus performers and worse. But now, for the first time, we expected their hearts and intelligence to accept us as friends in the security of their sanctuary, the sea. Falco and Cristobal enter the water first. Half expecting Cristobal to lunge for the open sea, patient Falco is gratified at Cristobal's decision to remain close by. Cole is next in with Pepito. Surprisingly enough, Pepito tests the perimeter of the netted cove. After several successful days of training with leash and harness, I asked Falco and Cole to experiment with releasing Pepito and Cristobal from their leashes. I was confident that they would still be aware of the harness. This recognition would keep them within close range of their companions, and they would not leap over the top of the enclosure nets. The partial release experiment is a success. Even Zoom seems to sense that his flippered cousins are about to enjoy the same unrestrained freedom he has long shared with the men of Calypso. The experiment is repeated for many days before Cousteau decides to begin the next sophisticated phase in the training. Its success will largely depend on faith and whether the divers and the seals have developed to some extent the same kind of relationship that has long existed between man and dog. On May 1st, Falco and Cole deliberately ignore the waiting ship to shore launch and with choice morsels of squid, calmly entice Cristobal and Pepito off the side of Calypso into the open sea. yellow buoy markers tied to the end of their leashes will help locate Pepito and Cristobal if they decide to head for home across the sea. The risky idea works. Pepito and Cristobal choose to remain close to their friends Falco and Cole. 
Together, they swim to the netted area to continue their daily games in the private park of their undersea world. There comes a time when all that has been learned must be put to the ultimate test. I felt instinctively that our training program had been successfully concluded the day when Cole and Pepito, Falco and Cristobal swam all the way from Calypso to the netted area without incident. I knew that we were ready for the final moment of faith, when man and sea mammal would be together as one, totally free in the sea. On the morning of May 3rd, the nets enclosing the training cove are taken aboard Calypso. Divers are cautioned to double check their gear. And Cousteau meets with head cameraman Michel Delois to discuss underwater slow motion film techniques and the underseas positioning of his cameras. For the unknowing Pepito and Cristobal, it is a morning like any other. And morning for them is a swim with their friends and squid. They do not know yet that today they will swim without the restraining harnesses or leashes, or that their tiny private underwater park will suddenly become as wide as the ocean itself. Soon the preparations are complete. The enclosure nets are finally aboard Calypso, and the divers, the onboard lookouts, and the picket boats are now in position. There is no turning back now. There are only anxious hopes in the hearts of the men of Calypso. Pepito goes first, to be followed by Cole. Falco and Cristobal go together. Uncharacteristically, Pepito and Cristobal surface almost immediately, as if they wanted to take their bearings like the Cape fur seals do in the wild before heading out to sea. Their friends Falco and Cole can only wait and hope.
When Pepito and Cor and Falco and Cristobal came home to Calypso, the doubts of my decision at Seal Island were finally dispelled. I knew now that men on a rookery did not have to mean death to the fur seals. Man and sea mammals could live together as loyal and affectionate friends if man decides he wants it that way. In the days and weeks that followed the end of the formal sea training of Pepito and Cristobal, it was difficult at times to distinguish between work and play. Perhaps for Pepito and Cristobal, there wasn't any difference. But for the divers, there was. Working at depths that require time-consuming staging to surface, the divers quickly capitalize on the unique physiological capability of the sea mammals to instantaneously surface without risking the fatal caisson's disease, the dreaded bends. The diver's sea entry chute provides the greatest recreation for Pepito and Cristobal and the men alike. A unique playground slide with the sea as a landing place instead of a sandbox. Apparently, Pepito and Cristobal had committed themselves to life aboard the Calypso. The divers began to take them along during their underwater explorations whenever they chose. Our man and sea mammal expeditions proceeded smoothly for several weeks. Then one day, we discovered the cannon of an ancient galleon. Falco and Cole, preoccupied by the sudden find of the cannon, were not immediately aware that Cristobal had finally succumbed to the oldest call of the wild, freedom. It was Captain Maritano who first noticed that something was amiss that Cristobal had surfaced at an unprecedented distance from the rising bubbles of the divers' air tanks, and that he was swimming strongly in a direction away from Calypso. 
The Caribbean waters, where man had long ago killed off the indigenous monk seals, was no place for a wandering fur seal to give in to his nomadic instincts. Marcel Fortcherry was the first to spot him. And while Cole was able to lure him close by the Zodiac with tempting squid, Cristobal knew all there was to know about the dip net. And then he was gone. Motivated fur seals on the move can attain speeds up to 15 miles per hour. They can remain underwater up to 20 minutes, and it is believed that they can dive to a depth of up to 1,200 feet. They can also remain at sea almost indefinitely, even sleeping there, literally rocked in the cradle of the waves. So little hope was held out for seeing Cristobal again. Calypso remains on search station for several days following the disappearance of Cristobal. But running low on supplies and fresh water, Captain Cousteau is reluctantly forced to return to Puerto Rico, some 200 miles distant. Pepito wanders the decks endlessly, searching for his oldest and closest friend. He does not completely understand yet that Cristobal is gone and he doesn't understand why the men are so quiet, why there are no more morning swims, or why his adopted hauling out place is on the move again. The men cannot tell him, nor can Zoom. So time after time, Pepito scampers back to his diver friend, Cole. Upon Calypso's arrival in San Juan, Captain Cousteau learns almost immediately that several days before, a surprised fisherman had captured a seal at sea. A curiously friendly seal, which promptly ate nearly 40 pounds of the fisherman's catch. To make up this deficit, the fisherman has sold the seal, and under gentle prodding from coal, tells where. because we had a dog for 14 years that we lost recently and it's kind of hard to replace an animal after you've had it so long and it was part of the family and then we saw this little fella and sort of took him to our heart so he was going to be a new member of the family and uh, you uh, wanted to make a surprise home by buying the animal or no i i just buy it and after that i called them by phone that i i have a surprise for them and when they came down they saw the Seal. I thought it was a dog. You thought it was a dog? <laughs> With such flippers? <laughs> a head, you mean? Yeah. For the first time in his unexpected voyage, Cristobal is genteelly chauffeured from suburban San Juan back to Calypso. Advance word goes out that he is coming home, and a great reunion celebration is quickly improvised. Raymo, the ship's chef, goes all out and prepares squid Provençal, not to be found on the menu at Maxime's, but an irresistible dish for fur seal gourmets. Reunited, Pepito and Cristobal, the guests of honor, arrive, and the banquet begins. And what a banquet it is. Attention à lui, le bas. Non, non, non. Attention à 
The time had come to take the maturing Pepito and Cristobal back to some windswept rookery to grow up and become mighty beach masters, proud lords of creation. But given the opportunity, would they choose to go? An old lullaby tells us the answer. You mustn't swim till you're six weeks old or your head will be sunk by the heels and summer gales and killer whales are bad for baby seals, as bad as bad can be. But splash and grow strong, and you can't go wrong, child of the open sea.